Fake news. The term grew massively thanks to Donald Trump post-2016, but it's something that's been around forever in practice. Tommy Hilfiger unfortunately feels the effects of it to this day. It sullied the reputation of his brand, and even 25 years later, some people still believe the original hateful rumor. Ralph Lauren was hip-hop's favorite brand in the 80s, but going into the 90s, things began to change as Tommy Hilfiger would soon become hip-hop's go-to attire. Part of this was organic, but part of it became intentional. Tommy Hilfiger started to emerge back in the 90s. Before that, I would say between 84 and 89, Polo was king. But Polo wasn't making the kind of stuff we felt was next level, so a lot of people stopped buying Polo at the time. We started seeing this line called Tommy Hilfiger. Was there anything in particular that caused the shift? Well, it may have been Ralph Lauren not catering to this massive base of customers they had because Raekwon had this to say about Tommy becoming the new and Ralph getting old. My thing was, if I saw a polo shirt with a lot of flags on it, I loved it. But when they just started putting a horse, I got bored with that. I remember buying a pair of Tommy pants for the first time. It was a pair of khakis that had that same tag and they fit good. Next thing you know, we started mentioning it in our rhymes. In my eyes, Polo started to get old, and Hilfiger was new. Their first huge look was in 1992, while on the set of Yo! MTV Raps with Mary J. Blige, Grand Pooba performed their song What's the 411, where he rapped, Will I be Pooba on this here, the nigga from last year, Jerbo's hanging baggy, Tommy Hilfiger top gear. This was big for several reasons. The first is that this was on Mary J. Blige's debut album, that would go multi-platinum, and she had a farther reach than just hip-hop. The second is that Brand Nubian was not really huge as a group. This Tommy shout-out wouldn't have gone that far had it been on one of their album cuts. And the third is that it was on television, MTV. This is how Andy, VP of Marketing and Tommy Hilfiger's brother, would come across hip-hop's love for their brand. At the time, I lived up in Spanish Harlem on Broadway and 109th Street. I remember some kids came up to me and were like, you gotta hear your brother's name in this song. I took it to Tommy and played it for him. While Tommy was walking through JFK Airport in New York with his brother, after coming back from a trip to Hong Kong, Andy recognized a rapper from the group Brand Nubian. Grand Pooba was rocking full Tommy. They had just done the show in Living Color. Tommy, here are the guys that are wearing your clothes and rapping about you. To which Tommy replied, oh, cool, let's say hi, let's meet them. Pooba was a bit shocked at first, not knowing who they were, until they introduced themselves. Andy invited them to the showroom and offered to dress them and give them all the clothes they wanted. The next day would come, the time scheduled was at 3 p.m. So the team showed up at 2.55. It struck 3 p.m. No brand Nubian. 3.15. Still. Nobody. And as Tommy looked to his VP of art direction, who he could tell was clearly nervous, he said, Lloyd, relax. Rappers are rock stars, and rock stars are never on time. They would walk in at 3.45, and Tommy would greet them and give them thanks for wearing his clothes and promoting it. No press involved. They gave them about $20,000 worth of clothes, which wasn't common back then. None of their competitors were dressing rappers or even rock and roll artists, but Tommy was ecstatic. Wow, can you imagine? They're freaking on stage wearing our clothes. They're saying my name in a song. Grand Pooba was just as thankful. Tommy was very supportive of me. Whenever I had a show or a video to shoot, they made sure I was good. They gave me whatever I needed. I could go to the warehouse in Jersey and get whatever I wanted. One time, Tommy even wrote me a check, a nice sum of money, six figures or something like that, to say thank you. He actually just called me out of the blue and was like, hey, here you go, man. Thanks a lot. I guess it was for doing everything that I did to help his brand. He realized that people into hip hop liked the baggier fitting Tommy clothes with logos plastered, and New York Magazine said the following. Hilfiger immediately understood the money to be made if he could align himself with popular rap stars. Andy Hilfiger began giving trunks of clothes away to any rapper with a recording contract. Soon, icons in the hood like Raekwon and Coolio began wearing Tommy Hilfiger on their concert tours and in their videos. Even Star, a massively popular radio host and host of his own show now, The Star Report on YouTube, starts every episode shouting out Hilfiger while wearing a piece of attire from the many boxes they had sent him decades ago. Tommy was ecstatic that popular artists and singers were wearing his brand. 
In a quote to the New York Times, he said, Having the music puts a certain image over the brand. If you don't have the music, you don't have the cool. You don't have the young people. Every designer has a certain type of cool they're trying to put in operation. At a Grammy Awards after party, Andy saw Snoop Dogg. This was pre-Doggy style. And the only reason he knew him was because of his appearance on Dr. Dre's music. He urged Tommy that they should talk to him because he was the hottest rapper in LA at the time. So he approached him with his brother and introduced himself. Snoop had heard of their clothes and was fairly receptive, to which Andy gave him his number and said to call if he wanted the hookup. He didn't think they would actually receive a call back, but the next day at noon, he had a message that said, Yo Andy, it's Snoop. I want to come check you out. He called him back, and within three hours, Snoop and his crew showed up to Hillfigure offices and were given a tour as well as clothes. The best was yet to come, because only two weeks later, Snoop called and told Andy he needed some more gear, so he invited him over. But Snoop had an issue. He couldn't go. He was rehearsing for Saturday Night Live and asked Andy if he could come to his hotel. It was a downpour of rain that night in New York. But Andy went to the offices, undressed the mannequins, and was off to the hotel at midnight. He brought over some new logos and rugby's, and by the next night, on March 19th, 1994, Hilfiger would get a huge look, as big of a look as you could possibly get. Snoop Dogg was performing on SNL, wearing Tommy. Tommy would call his brother saying, Andy, turn on Saturday Night Live. Those guys we met, Snoop, they're wearing my clothes. I'm like, yeah, I know, I forgot to tell you. I went to their hotel last night. He said, oh my God. The shirt Snoop was wearing sold out everywhere the next day. The salespeople from all over the country were asking questions. Did something happen because everybody wants more rugby's. Everyone wants more of our logoed items. This was the moment things went mainstream, which was bittersweet for Grand Puba. People tried to say Snoop wearing Tommy on Saturday Night Live is what made Tommy's clothes take off. And Snoop was trying to run with that, but everybody else kept correcting him. When you go to the radio, they're like, no, correction, Grand Puba is the one. I mean, Snoop heard it from me. I felt like I was not getting the full justice. I just think I deserve more at that point. He was right, he made it cool, but Snoop Dogg undeniably made it mainstream. 1996 was the year of Tommy. He would win menswear designer of the year, reach $320 million in sales, and all the stars in hip hop were wearing his brand. They decided to launch a more sporty version of Tommy Hilfiger called Tommy Jeans to accommodate the different demands that people within hip hop wanted. It was for a younger demographic that wanted more flair, more colors, more logos. The first fashion show they did for Tommy Jeans was with Vibe. Of the many names that were either walking down the runway, performing, or in the audience were TLC, Q-Tip, Mark Ronson, Mary J. Blige, Raekwon, Diddy, Method Man, Limp Biscuit, and even Quincy Jones, a close friend whose daughter Kidada Jones was also working for Tommy at the time. Everyone who was anyone was there, and this model of fashion show would be taken and emulated by other people within hip hop when launching their own fashion brands, like Russell Simmons' Fat Farm and Baby Fat to Diddy Sean John. They were carbon copies of what Tommy Jeans originated. The women's wear line took over when Aaliyah became the poster girl for Tommy. We created a new look with Aaliyah, and that look is still popular today. Now I see all kinds of companies doing the whole bando tops with the underwire waistband, and we did that first. Tommy girl prior to Aaliyah was far more preppy, more plaid, and a schoolgirl type of look. But when Aaliyah came in, she added a whole new style to it. The internet was just starting to take off, and while 1996 was a great year for Tommy, it wouldn't end so well when millions of people began receiving an email urging them to boycott his clothes. There were two versions of this email. We'll read both of them. The first example had the subject line as follows. Forward, Tommy Hilfiger hates us, dot dot dot, and would continue in the body paragraph. Did you see the recent Oprah Winfrey show on which Tommy Hilfiger was a guest? Oprah asked Hilfiger if his alleged statements about people of color were true. He's been accused of saying things such as, if I had known that African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians would buy my clothes, I would not have made them so nice. And, I wish those people would not buy my clothes. They were made for upper class whites. What did he say when Oprah asked him if he said these things? He said, yes. Oprah immediately asked Hilfiger to leave her show. Now let's give Hilfiger what he's asked for. Let's not buy his clothes. Boycott. 
please pass this message along. The second one was a bit more colorful in language. Subject, did you see the show? November 28th. For those who missed the Oprah Winfrey show where she interviewed the fashion designer, he made a very racist remark regarding the people that purchase his clothing line. Summed up, he basically said that if he had known that so many Chinamen and ERs were going to buy his clothes, he never would have made it so nice. After which, Oprah kindly asked him to leave. Now that we all know that he's a big time racist, my suggestion is that we and all of our friends should boycott the Tommy Hilfiger line. I don't see any point in supporting someone who has such a narrow mind. What a jerk this guy is. Yeah, if it weren't for us Chinamen and ERs, does he think he can be where he is today? Please forward this to everyone you know. He really does not deserve anyone's support at all. This spread like wildfire. People believed it. Hell, people still believe it today. There were rumors like this about other designers as well. One was Liz Claiborne, who in the early 90s, about 1992, had a fake email spread about her that she disparaged black women while on Oprah. Spike Lee even believed it. Last week, Oprah Winfrey had Liz Claiborne on the show. I guess she wears Liz Claiborne's clothes all the time. Liz Claiborne got on and said she didn't make clothes for black people. Oprah stopped the show and told her to get her ass off the set. How are you going to get on Oprah's show and say you don't make clothes for black women? It definitely happened. Get the tape. Every black woman in America needs to go to their closet, throw that stuff out, and never buy another stitch of clothes from Liz Claiborne. Except it didn't happen, and there was no tape. But that wasn't the only rumor that went viral on the internet. A separate story was about both Tommy and Ralph Lauren appearing on CNN's style with Elsa Clench. When they were congratulated for selling their clothes in Asia, Ralph thanked the Asian consumers. But Tommy supposedly said that he preferred if they didn't wear his clothes because it didn't look good on them. Tommy initially just tried to ignore these viral rumors. He didn't want to address the negativity and believe that people would just see him for his character and who he demonstrated himself to be over these years. Even Grand Pooba said he didn't think Tommy said it like that and he knew he wasn't racist. Tommy thought it would go away, but it didn't. And he would eventually address it, not once, not twice, but multiple times throughout his career. Why are people saying this about us, Tommy? He's the total opposite of that. Tommy really took it personal. We've never pinpointed one specific group of people we want to dress or not dress. Tommy's first store was called People's Place. It was for everybody. It was really messed up that this happened. Even after we did the Vibe Show, there was jealousy out there because people saw the success we were having. He wasn't on Oprah until Oprah brought him on to say it was a big lie. The company would respond with the statement. Tommy Hilfiger did not make the alleged inappropriate racial comments. Hilfiger wants his clothing to be enjoyed by people of all backgrounds, and his collections are put together with the broadest cross-section of individuals in mind. To reinforce this, he features models of all ethnic backgrounds in his fashion shows and advertisements. But this wasn't going to spread. The damage was done. But he would eventually go on Oprah in 2007, over 10 years later. Tommy, in the 21 years that we've been on the air, have you ever been on the show? Winfrey asked Hilfiger. Unfortunately not. It's contrary to what my business motive was at the beginning. I wanted to sell a lot of clothes to a lot of people. In 2012, he would address it again on Women's Wear Daily. We had heard that I was supposedly on Oprah, and I had told her that if I had known black people were going to buy my clothes, I wouldn't have been a designer. I had never been on Oprah, and I had never said that. And I would never believe that anyway, nor would I ever say that anyway. Then, Joel Horowitz, who was still chief executive of the business, came to me and said, do you know in my Jewish community, people are saying that you also don't want Jewish people wearing your clothes? Then we read the Filipino tabloids. Then we heard from Hispanics that I didn't want them wearing my clothes. And pretty soon, dogs and cats. It was a rumor and a myth. Oprah invited me. Some people may still believe it. He even answered the question that we all probably had looming in our heads, which was whether or not it impacted the sales of the brand. It hurt for a long period of time. Not from a business standpoint, because our business doubled in that time. It went from $1 billion to $2 billion in that time. But it hurt here, placing his hands on his heart. It really made me believe someone was out for me. We really never found the source, but hope that at some point in time, people will realize it was just a nasty rumor. By the 2000s, Tommy had fallen out of favor within hip-hop. Not necessarily because of the rumors, but it became too mainstream and people opted for more of the copycats of Tommy Hilfiger from within hip-hop, such as Russell Simmons' Fat Farm, Diddy's Sean John, and even Dame Dash and Jay-Z's Rockaware. Hell, 
You could even throw G-Unit in there, although it wasn't much like Tommy. Tommy wouldn't experience a resurgence until the 2010s when ASAP Rocky was really interested in it, but it was more for the nostalgia factor of their 90s gear, more than what the brand was doing at that moment. But Tommy didn't need to be niche anymore. They were global, a household name. But the saddest part about all of this is that people haven't changed. Because even if a rumor would surface like this today, nothing would be different. People would still believe it. People would still spread it even when it only takes less than 10 seconds of research to fact check it.